Hi, my name is Paul and I recently went through every single listing on the Toronto Stock Exchange and came up with a list of the top 7 securities that I believe are the most likely to give great returns over the long run. Now, before I get started on this list, I do want to mention that compiling this was a very long process, and the market moves pretty quickly. So while I can say that I believe that these are all quality businesses that will likely have good returns over the long run, valuations may have changed or new information may have come to light during the process of recording and editing this video that might have otherwise led me to change up the list. But for the most part, I did my best to make things as accurate as I could given the circumstances. And on that note, I feel obliged to tell you that I am not a financial advisor. I'm just a Canadian guy who likes investing, and these are my opinions. So, do not go out and buy these stocks just because I think that they're good investments. You should instead use this video as a jumping off point to do additional research into any of the businesses that you find interesting or appealing. Also, there are many businesses that trade on the TSX that are outside of my circle of competence, and if I don't understand a business or industry, or if that business or industry is reliant on something that I don't understand or can't reasonably predict, then I won't be able to accurately evaluate the quality of that stock. One example of an industry that's too difficult for me to understand without there being an enormous margin of safety is gold mining. Now, I can understand when the value of the gold under the ground is worth more than the current price tag on the business, but in the case of most gold mining companies, the challenge is in knowing how difficult or costly it will be to get the gold out. This cost can be affected by terrain and structural difficulties, the hard to predict costs of cyanide used in the leaching process, as well as erratic spot prices and ESG regulations and fines on the resultant tailings which can significantly impact profits. Simply put, sometimes there are just too many difficult moving parts for me to understand whether a company that looks cheap actually is. So because of this, I find it much better to filter out and ignore companies that are outside of my circle of competence unless there's a massive margin of safety. And this list will be no exception to that rule. This means that the companies included in my list are ones that I understand well enough to personally feel confident in over the long run. So with that said, let's get the list starting with number 7, BRP, abbreviated from Bombardier Recreational Products, and it trades with the ticker symbol DOO. BRP is a company that makes and sells boats, recreational vehicles, and components and accessories all around the world under the banners of their high-quality brands. The brand Manitou creates high-end recreational and luxury pontoon-style boats, while Alumacraft creates lightweight aluminum speedboats. The company's Can-Am brands offer a lineup of customizable off-road ATVs and side-by-side -side vehicles, as well as on-road three-wheelers. BRP also owns the brand Rotax, which makes vehicle powertrains, or the system of parts that are needed to power up a vehicle, as well as small aircraft engines, go-kart and other vehicle components, and merchandise. In addition to that, BRP owns Tellwater, which is Australia's leading aluminum boat and boat trailer manufacturer, as well as Lynx, which is a snowmobile brand designed to fight through challenging deep snow terrain. Then there are the two crown jewels of BRP's portfolio, the Sea-Doo and Ski-Doo brands. Sea-Doo is among the most recognizable jet ski brands that also manufactures more economical pontoon boats, and Ski-Doo is the top-selling snowmobile brand in the world. So, Bombardier Recreational Products has a suite of high-quality brands, and they operate in an industry that I believe will only continue to grow for many decades into the future. The world is clearly becoming more and more wealthy, with larger population countries like China and India experiencing a burgeoning middle class. This puts a significantly greater number of people on trajectory to go beyond meeting their financial needs and actually having a surplus of money which will in turn lead to more and more leisure time. This puts companies that offer different forms of leisure in an excellent spot for future growth, and I believe that BRP's high quality brands have a clear path carved out for the next 30 plus years. Now, looking at the company's fundamentals, BRP trades with a trailing 12 month PE of around 9.8, which probably needs to be adjusted for increased leisure spending throughout 2021 because of stimulus money and lockdowns. In reality, the company is probably trading at a PE in the range of 14 to 15, which is historically still on the low end for BRP, especially when considering that the company has been compounding revenues by over 10.5% per year, and more importantly, compounding earnings by nearly 23% per year between 2011 and 2019, which completely removes their much stronger 2020 and 2021 numbers. BRP also pays a small dividend of 0.64% that has plenty of room to increase over the coming years since the pandemic adjusted payout ratio is still under 20%. So what are the things keeping BRP from making it higher up on this list? Well, there's three issues really. 
First is that the company has more liabilities than assets, giving it a negative tangible book value per share, which on its own isn't necessarily a terrible thing. However, the company also operates in the space of recreation, which is one that will always be hit hard during times of recession since discretionary spending on leisure is usually one of the first expenditures to get cut when times are rough. Coupling that with the company's liabilities leads me to believe that there is a potential risk of bankruptcy should there be a prolonged recession. The last worry that I have with the company is regarding the rare earth metals used in the semiconductors that are needed for BRP's vehicles. These metals are currently in short supply, and to make matters worse, the process of recycling these metals can be both energy intensive and release harmful emissions that may be subject to ESG regulations, and this could lead to lower margins or a decrease in projected sales revenues over the coming decades. So those are the pros and cons of stock number 7 on my list. For the purpose of full disclosure, I personally do not own any shares of BRP stock and I don't currently have any plans to buy shares at the current price. Though I do have this one on my watch list and I might pick up shares if I believe it's the best place for my money to be invested. But currently I have six other Canadian companies that I believe present a better opportunity than BRP does. So coming in at stock number six is Home Capital Group, ticker symbol HCG. Home Capital Group operates in the financial sector, specifically in the banking industry, with a specialization in underwriting mortgage loans. In addition to home financing, Home Capital Group also offers credit cards, GICs, and high interest savings accounts through the Home Trust, Home Bank, and Oaken Financial brands. Now, I'm going to cut right to the chase with this one since I don't think anyone is looking at a company like Home Capital because it has competitive lending and savings account rates, which it does, but the real reason that the company is worth looking at is because of its fundamentals. Over the past four years, Home Capital has been steadily compounding EPS growth at a rate of 30%, and the company recently announced guidance during their latest webcast for a 15% return on equity next year. In addition to that, the equity in the company is currently trading at less than 10% above tangible book value per share, and the company trades with a trailing PE of around 8. Simply put, Home Capital Group is a fast-growing company that's trading incredibly cheaply, even for the financials industry. What's even better is that the management is very aware that the company is currently undervalued, and over the course of the past year, the company completed a substantial course issuer bid repurchasing 13.6% of the company for an average price of $43.50. Also, the company was recently approved for a normal course issuer bid to repurchase an additional 10% of the company's float on the open market at what is currently around a 15% discount to the previous round of repurchases. The reason that Home Capital can afford to do these repurchases while also reinstating the dividend is largely to do with the reversal for provisions required for credit losses in recent quarters, which just means that the company had set aside a bunch of capital for an expected increase in loan defaults during the pandemic, but because the loans performed much better than they expected, the company now has a bunch of extra cash that it can use for buybacks since the risk levels have normalized. And while we're on the topic of risk, let's dive a little bit deeper. Home Capital Group is currently operating well above the Basel III Common Equity Tier 1 capital regulations and its own guided CET1 range. Now, if you don't know anything about banking requirements and regulations, that last sentence was probably very confusing, so I'll try and make it easier to understand. As of 2009, Basel III international lending regulations require banks to have a capital adequacy ratio of at least 8%, of which at least 6% must be covered by Common Equity Tier 1 capital. This just means that banks must be able to cover at least 8% of their risk-weighted assets, with assets like unsecured loans being weighted as highly risky and assets like cash or treasury bills being weighted as low risk. Home Capital clears the Basel III CET1 requirements of 6% more than three times over, even surpassing the company's own target range of 14 to 15%. This means that even without factoring in the additional expected cash flows for the next year, the company has plenty of room to take on more loans, hike the dividend, or buy back more shares, which you'd know is a serious consideration if you listen to the Q&A portion of the latest quarterly webcast. Now for the bad stuff. Unfortunately, not everything here is sunshine and rainbows, and there is one huge risk worth consideration. Back in August of 2014, Home Capital was trading at a share price of over $54, and by May of 2017, the stock was down to about $8.5. Over this period, there were two major drops that resulted in this 85% decline. The first drop was caused by allegations from the OSC claiming that fraud was committed by some of Home Capital's mortgage brokers, who were allegedly lying about the income of borrowers in order to originate larger loans. 
This led to a probe that ended with the firing of over 40 of the company's leading brokers who drove significant business to the company. This was shocking, but an even more unsettling revelation caused the second drop. In April of 2017, the Ontario Securities Commission filed a report claiming that the company had misled shareholders on the reasons behind the substantial decline in loan originations. Home Capital's management claimed that the drop in business was caused by external factors like macroeconomics, when in actuality the drop was attributable to the loss of some of the company's top brokers. The Security Commission's article implicated the CFO, the CEO, and the president of Home Capital and revealed internal emails that appear to show intention and acknowledgement of the cover-up. This revelation of the management's behavior obviously tarnished the reputation of the company, and hundreds of millions of assets under administration were withdrawn by wary customers, most of whom will probably never trust the company again. Thankfully, as of 2017, the management team has been completely replaced, and under the leadership of Yusri Basada, things have turned around. That having been said, the recency of the scandal definitely weighs in the minds of some, which may continue to affect the stock's multiples. However, it is possible that there is still a corrupt culture plaguing the business, and that's something that you'll have to consider if you ever plan on investing in the company. Personally, I believe that after wiping out the former management team and brokers who committed fraud, as well as undergoing multiple probes from the Ontario Securities Commission, it's unlikely that there's any more underhanded activity going on. Otherwise, this company would never have made the list. And honestly, Home Capital Group making this list at all was pretty surprising to me. See, I started a position in the company back in mid to late 2015 after the first scandal, which was something I was completely unaware of at the time. Back then, I was the type of investor whose entire research came by way of comparing fundamental metrics, and when I came across Home Capital Group, it just appeared to be an undervalued business on the verge of a rebound. So, because I didn't do any qualitative research into the operations of the business, I got to experience firsthand the quantitative evisceration of what appeared to be a fundamentally sound investment. Thankfully, experiencing that 65% crash in one trading day made me eventually come to terms with the fact that I was focused entirely on the cheese and was completely oblivious to the trap that was holding it. Since then, I vowed to always hold my position at Home Capital Group as a constant reminder to be aware of the dangers of not looking beyond a company's numbers. To this day, I still hold the exact same shares from 2015 in my Canadian cash account. It's the smallest position in the portfolio with a cost basis of around $30, making up roughly 1.7% of the holdings. I do not plan to add any more shares of home capital at the moment, though if the price is right, I'll definitely consider adding more. However, right now, I believe there are still five better investments on the TSX. So, moving on to number five, we have Manulife Financial, ticker symbol MFC. Manulife is also in the financial sector, operating as a banking, insurance, and asset management company in the US, Canada, Europe, and Asia, offering products and services to individuals and businesses. Manulife's insurance segment offers insurance for health, travel, life, home, accident, retirement, individual annuity, business, income protection, and checking and savings account protection. The company's banking segment offers credit cards, home mortgages, and other loans, and checking, savings, and investment accounts. Meanwhile, the company's wealth and asset management business offers portfolio management, investment counseling, private banking, wealth and estate planning, specialized investment funds and trusts, and other investment solutions like linked investment assurances. Manulife, much like BRP, will likely experience the majority of its future growth from the global enrichment of poorer countries. This should come mostly from an increase in the need for banking and wealth management throughout Manulife's operations in Asia. Currently, many people who live in emerging market countries do not currently have or use bank accounts. But as those developing countries begin to prosper, the increase in jobs and wealth will almost certainly lead to an increase in demand for previously unattainable money to be securely stored and invested. Manulife, having built business operations throughout many developing Asian countries with large populations of unbanked people, is in prime position to meet this demand. A recent example of this is Manulife's partnership with Viet In, the second largest bank in Vietnam. Many of the Asian countries where Manulife operates in are projected to have substantial economic growth, with Vietnam and the Philippines expected to make the largest climbs up the global GDP rankings according to PwC's research. When comparing Manulife to Canada's other bank stocks, I currently don't see how TD, RBC, or the rest of the big banks in Canada will be able to match the emerging economic boom that Manulife has exposure to. The closest real competitor is probably Scotiabank, which still only has a few scattered branches throughout China and India, and then a few one-off locations in Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Singapore. 
That said, Scotiabank does have a 49% stake in Thailand's fifth largest bank, which serves roughly 4 million customers. But this is tiny in comparison to Manulife's partnership with Viet Inn, which serves more than three times as many customers in a country that's expected to grow significantly faster. And that's completely without accounting for Manulife's other positions throughout the rest of Asia. For a company set to experience more future growth than its peers, you'd expect to have to pay a higher premium. But in Manulife's case, it's trading at a PE of around 7.2, while National Bank, which currently has the lowest multiple on any of the larger Canadian banks, is currently trading with a PE of around 10.5. On top of that, Manulife offers the largest annual dividend yield of all the banks while maintaining a low payout ratio of around 33%, which is in line with its competition. So, Manulife currently offers more international diversity, greater future growth opportunities, and a better dividend, all for a lower price than its peers. This is what originally attracted me to the business in the first place. But another notable aspect about Manulife is its minimal downside risk, thanks in part to Canada's strict banking and insurance regulations, but also the company's conservative financial leverage ratio of only 25.8% and the ability for the company to easily exceed Canada's regulatory requirements like the LICAT ratio, which is used to ensure that a reasonable solvency buffer is being met by the company. In Manulife's case, the company surpasses the 90% coverage requirement by more than 50 percentage points. That having been said, every bank who makes money from holding other people's money is going to be subject to cyclicality during times of recession. This is because during a recession, people tend to have less money on hand and will pull from their investments and savings in order to pay for expenses. In Manulife's case, they also operate in insurance. And insurance is also an industry that tends to have a tougher time during periods of recession since people will often cut down on coverage in order to afford things that might be more necessary. And I would consider this recessionary downside to be Manulife's main risk going forward. Despite this, I think that Manulife presents a good long-term investment opportunity, especially around current valuations. Personally, I do own shares in Manulife in my Canadian cash account, and it makes up about 8.8% of the current portfolio, making it the fourth largest position in the account, with an average share price of around $24 per share, most of which was bought in early to mid-December. You should probably know though that this isn't an accurate representation of my holdings in Manulife because in December I decided to sell my TFSA position in Manulife that was purchased in 2012 for under $13 per share. This position was then repurchased and added to somewhat in my standard Canadian cash account. And this decision was made to add to two different companies within my TFSA that I believe have greater growth opportunities. One of which will be mentioned later in the video and the other will not just because it's not a Canadian stock. Going to stock number four, we have Knight Therapeutics, trading under the ticker symbol GUD. Knight operates as a pharmaceutical company that acquires licenses, markets, and distributes drugs and other health products and devices throughout Latin America and Canada. Knight Therapeutics owns a diverse portfolio of innovative and branded generic drug treatments for various forms of cancers and infectious diseases, as well as gastrointestinal and central nervous system diseases. Now, I've said before that I don't have a medical background or knowledge that's fully required to understand Knight's business, and this is still the case. But I do understand when a business is being run exceptionally well by people who have achieved exceptional results. So for me, Knight is more of an investment in what I believe to be top-notch management utilizing a proven business model. Knight Therapeutics is currently led by CEO Samira Sakia, and the executive chairman of the board is Knight's founder and former CEO Jonathan Ross Goodman. Prior to Knight's founding, both Samira and Jonathan had leadership positions at Paladin Labs, a company that Goodman founded with less than $10 million and helped to build into a $3.2 billion acquisition within a period of about 10 years. Also, both Sakia and Goodman are invested in the company and have only ever added to their positions. But the best part of all of this is that the exact strategy that Paladin used to grow in the US is currently being used by Knight in Latin America. This strategy involves operating with almost no debt and acquiring the rights to old and underpromoted drugs that can be profitably marketed, developed, and grown. Knight also lends money to biopharmaceutical companies in order to gain product rights, should any innovative drugs make it through trials. In my opinion, this massively reduces the risk of investing in a biopharma company while retaining a lot of the upside potential should one of those drugs become successful. Another interesting thing about Knight Therapeutics is its valuation. Assuming Knight's recent acquisition of Biotscana Investments and Exelon are actually worth what the company paid for them, we can assume that the real tangible book value per share hasn't actually dropped, 
meaning that a fair price for Knight's shares based solely on tangible book value should probably be closer to about $7 than the roughly $5.50 that it currently trades at. But this is only on the basis of tangible book value per share, which would be completely discounting the revenue and net operating income growth, both of which have been pretty strong, minus a few hiccups. Unfortunately, this is where I have to touch on the negatives. Operating in Latin American countries means dealing in foreign currencies, some of which are currently experiencing hyperinflation and devaluation, which has impacted profitability due to foreign exchange losses in the past and even in the most recent quarter. And this is something that may continue to impact profitability going forward. That said, Knight does tend to keep a lot of cash on hand, and I would imagine that medical treatment is something that would be considered by consumers as needs-oriented. So I don't think that there's a high likelihood of bankruptcy or significant impact during a recessionary period. As for my personal investments, Knight is one of the two companies that I purchased shares of using the capital from selling my position in Manulife, and Knight is currently the fifth largest position in my TFSA, making up over 9.4% of the portfolio. Knight is also my second largest position in the monthly public portfolio, comprising almost 18.8% of the total holdings there. This is a position that I've been regularly adding to over the last eight months or so for an average share price in both accounts in the range of $5.30. The third best stock on my list for the TSX is MTY Food Group, with the ticker symbol MTY. MTY is a company that franchises and operates restaurants in addition to distributing food and selling branded retail products. The company owns over 80 different restaurant brands that offer a wide variety of different dining experiences and cuisines, with some of their most recognizable brands being Papa Murphy's, Taco Time, Baja Fresh, Yuzu Sushi, Thai Express, Mr. Sub, Sweet Frog, and Cold Stone Creamery. Now, none of MTY's restaurant brands control anywhere near the largest portion of market share within their given niche, but the company takes a very unique approach compared to their competitors within the restaurant industry. Where brands like McDonald's, KFC, and Subway regularly focus on investing capital into new menu items and branding to make their already massive brands appeal to even more people, MTY instead spends its money acquiring successful cash flow positive brands and expanding into new locations when demand is high. This strategy of acquiring and expanding smaller cash-generating businesses has been working for over 20 years, thanks in large part to former CEO, founder, and current executive chairman, Stanley Ma, who also happens to be the company's largest shareholder. Furthermore, I believe that MTY's brand diversity has an added growth catalyst stemming from food delivery apps like Uber Eats, which are beginning to sell subscription services that encourage people to eat out more often. The idea here is that if people eat out more often, they'll be more likely to try out different cuisines and categories, which is where MTY's restaurants have a greater representation than their competitors. Regardless of future potential, the idea of acquiring smaller companies that compete against the industry giants that have undeniable brand recognition is a daunting one to many investors. And the thought of buying into a business that doesn't have a clear competitive advantage spits in the face of what many long-term investors have learned to believe. This is exactly why a company like MTY can go almost completely unnoticed while outpacing virtually every other publicly traded restaurant company on the market for over a decade in terms of EPS growth when factoring out 2020 for abnormal pandemic-related conditions that affected the entire industry. Normally, a company that's been compounding earnings by nearly 20% per year would be trading at a much higher multiple than its competitors. However, MTY trades with a trailing PE of under 16 which is cheaper than the vast majority of its larger, slow-growing peers like Yum! Brands, Restaurant Brands International, and McDonald's. MTY is also heavily discounted when evaluating it based on its dividend, which has around a 1.6% yield with a payout ratio of under 20%. If we extrapolate this to see what the company could be paying out shareholders with a 100% payout ratio, the yield would be over 7.7%, which is more than double that of McDonald's maximum current potential dividend yield. So, based on those factors, MTY is undervalued. However, MTY's business does have risk that needs to be considered, and this may have an impact on its business valuation. It's no secret that restaurants aren't recession-proof businesses. But going beyond this, MTY's strategy of regularly buying out companies to expand their portfolio is largely funded by taking on debt. Looking at the company's past few years of balance sheet history, it's easy to see that the company often operates with a current ratio below 1%. This means that the company operates with more current liabilities than assets. And we can also see here that the company has more total liabilities than tangible assets. So, if a lasting recession were to come in the near future, there is the potential for this business to find itself in some serious financial trouble that could end in bankruptcy. 
Noting these risks, the way that MTY made it through the pandemic shutdowns by making the tough decision to cut the dividend rather than deciding to take out debt or issue new shares made me feel much more secure in the management's capability to make good decisions that protect shareholder value. This has recently led me to pick up shares of the company in my $100 per month public portfolio where it makes up about 8% of the holdings, as well as in my personal Canadian cash account, where MTY is among the smallest positions just because I haven't had much time to fully allocate as much capital as I'd like to into the company. My current cost basis in this account is just shy of $52 per share, and MTY makes up roughly 4.6% of the portfolio. But, like I said, I do plan on adding more to these shares in the future, assuming it stays around current prices. The second best TSX stock is a company that might be a bit of a surprise to anyone that follows my monthly portfolio series, since this is a company whose shares cost more than $100 and the stock doesn't currently have fractional shares offered by Wellsimple. This stock is GoEasy. Ticker symbol GSY. GoEasy operates as a non-prime lender through its Easy Home and Easy Financial brands. The Easy Home brand offers product leases and lease-to-own services that allows customers to use flexible payment plans to purchase electronics like cell phones and computers, as well as home appliances and furniture. Meanwhile, the Easy Financial segment of the business offers personal, home equity, auto, and business loans, as well as point-of-sale financing and bundled insurance and benefit plans for vehicle protection, home safety, and personal security and discounts. GoEasy is a company that has been experiencing massive growth over the past few years, thanks in large part to its constant consumer-centric innovation in a space that is widely considered predatory, but more on that later. The company actively works to improve its services by frequently adding new products available through its Easy Home segment, as well as making their payment structures flexible and easy to understand. In addition to this, the company offers some of the lowest non-prime rates for those who don't have the option of getting a loan from the bank, even if they don't have any credit history. Additionally, the company has recently begun expanding its services into new areas, including auto loans, which has recently added in 2021 and is already scaled to making up over 5% of new customers. But the largest growth vector going forwards is definitely the new point-of-sale financing addition to the business, which allows customers to finance purchases directly at a merchant's checkout, both online and in person. The buy-now-pay-later model of this point-of-sale financing already makes up nearly 30% of new customers thanks to the recent Lendcare acquisition that brought with it over 6,000 partnered merchants in addition to opportunities for cross-platform marketing that is already being tested and, apparently, showing positive results. On top of this, GoEasy is currently developing a mobile app that is expected to launch later this year, and it will allow customers to more easily view the company's wide variety of products available with loan offers matching their specific credit portfolio and tailored to their individual borrowing needs. Finally, GoEasy CEO Jason Mullins has recently begun talking about expanding the business abroad, which I would expect to significantly increase loan originations. All of these different pathways point towards long-term business growth, and it makes it hard for me to see the business organically failing to return value to shareholders over the long run, especially when considering the low valuation on premium earnings and accelerated revenue growth. See, GoEasy currently trades at a PE of around 13, when adjusting for the $75.8 million one-time earnings increase that came from GoEasy's stake in Paybright, which was acquired by a firm for a mix of cash and equity during the first quarter of last year. So, for an adjusted trailing earnings multiple of only 13, you can buy a company that has been compounding adjusted earnings growth at a rate of 36% over the past 5 years, and that has been rapidly increasing consumer loan originations, which has primarily been led by the company's relentless innovation of the easy financial segment. But, GoEasy is more than just a compounding machine. It also pays a solid dividend of $3.64 per share, which comes out to a yield of around 2.9%. And this was increased by almost 38% over last year's $2.64 per share. Also, this 38% dividend increase shouldn't be discounted as a massive one-time hike, because the company has been consistently returning capital to shareholders for years, with the dividend growing at an average of 34.5% per year since 2014. On top of this, GoEasy has also been repurchasing its shares fairly consistently over the years, which you'd assume would provide even more value to investors, but unfortunately this is a bit of a red herring. Even though it is true that the company has been repurchasing shares for cancellation, the reality is that they've also been issuing new common shares at a faster rate, as you can see by the net change to diluted shares outstanding over the same period. Now, aside from it feeling a bit weird for a company to be highlighting repurchases while issuing more than four times that amount of shares over the previous year, 
it is understandable for a company that's been expanding operations the way that GoEasy has been to need capital to fund that growth. And when you stop to consider that the most recent issuance of common stock was done to fulfill the equity deal agreement in the acquisition of Lendcare, this really doesn't feel like that big of a deal. Even when accounting for the roughly 3% rate of annual dilution post-2014, the business has still been providing far better returns than the market at large for more than two decades. Plus, with over 23% of shares held by insiders, the management is definitely aligned with the shareholders' best interests. So that leaves the question, what business does this fast-growing, dividend-paying company have trading at such a low multiple? It definitely isn't because of the debt load, since the company has a positive and growing tangible book value per share, and has a net leverage ratio below 70%. It also isn't likely trading at a discount because of worries that customers won't be able to pay back their loans, since net charge-offs, which are loans that have been written off as a loss, are currently occurring at the lower end of the business's target range, making the risk of loans more predictable, which allows better preparation and more efficient allocation of excess capital that would otherwise be held as provisions. In fact, the management was so confident in GoEasy's stability that they claimed on the most recent conference call that they'd be able to sustain the dividend throughout periods of extended economic stress. So, the answer as to why the company trades at such low multiples relative to its growth comes from the belief that the company is a usurious sin stock that preys upon its customers. Most people take one look and see that GoEasy's interest rates on loans are around 35, 40, 45 percent, depending on the customer's borrowing history, and throw GoEasy in the same basket as predatory payday lending companies that offer short term loans at extremely high rates that can equate to as much as 600 percent APY. Now, payday loans have built up a reputation of deception and harm through the use of hidden fees and difficult repayment structures, sometimes leading to people owing more in debt than they could ever hope to repay forcing them into bankruptcy. GoEasy does not operate in this way. The goal of the company is to offer better alternatives to payday loans with more affordable and flexible repayment schedules that allow customers to rebuild credit, giving non-prime borrowers a second chance. And the company has been incredibly successful in doing this. Within the last 12 months, 60% of GoEasy's customers have improved their credit score, and one-third of borrowers have actually managed to achieve prime credit score levels. This is because the company is incredibly customer-centric, and the management understands that it's much better to have long-lasting, win-win relationships with its customers that build trust and brand loyalty. Which, honestly, is great, but this reality isn't aligned with public perception of the company. Many people still see GoEasy as being another exploitative business preying on the financially illiterate. And unfortunately, this public perception does carry risk, because if enough people feel that, say, interest rates on loans above 30% are unethical, this would inevitably lead to regulation that would not only significantly lower GoEasy's margins, but would also likely force the business to reject a large number of the borrowers that have damaged credit. Now, if this does happen, it would be a travesty for Canadians who would otherwise have a second chance to rebuild their credit score, and it would be catastrophic to GoEasy's business. But that's a topic that could be its own full video, so I'll conclude this by noting that it's very real concern for anyone considering investing in this stock. Personally, I decided that the risk was worth the reward on GoEasy just before the lockdown started up in February of 2020, for an initial cost basis of $62 per share. As the share prices of GoEasy plummeted throughout the following crash, I picked up more shares and lowered my cost basis to a touch over $47 per share, and I haven't bought any more shares since mostly because the stock grew to one-third of the value of my total TFSA throughout the market rally, and after coming back down a little bit, GoEasy currently makes up about 17.5% of the portfolio, which is a position size that I'm happy to hold, but am cautious to add to given the regulatory risks. And last but not least, the top Canadian security trading on the TSX is the Morgard North American Residential Real Estate Investment Trust, ticker symbol MRG. Now, if you watched a few of my other videos, you already knew that this was going to be at the top of the list, and you probably also know that there are two other more guards trading on the TSX, so make sure that you're looking at the right one. It's got the ticker symbol MRG, not one of the other ones. So, MRG rents out apartments in major cities and urban areas throughout Canada and the United States, with their main focus on areas that are projected to see higher levels of long-term population growth, including the greater Toronto area and, in specific states, like Florida, Texas, Colorado, and Georgia. Now, renting is clearly a needs-based business that won't be going away anytime soon, which is nice for long-term sustainability, but the best part about this company is definitely the valuation. 
See, Morgard is trading at nearly a 50% discount to its tangible price to book value per share, meaning that even though the company is trading at $20.20 per share, the value on the company's assets minus the liabilities, goodwill, and intangible assets are actually worth around $38 per share. This sort of discount to book value would make sense for a company whose assets were tied up in inventory that's difficult to sell, or for companies that run a deficit. But Morgard owns a valuable real estate and has positive net operating income. Plus, it pays a hearty monthly dividend with an annual yield of 3.5%. Even when comparing it to its peer residential REITs, it's trading at a significant discount on almost every single metric. Whether that be the price per apartment unit, the average monthly rent per unit, or the price to net operating income per unit. The company is also still trading below its pre-COVID levels, and I almost hesitate to say this, but short of significant over-appraisals and impending real estate crash or a major recession or some sort of freak accident or significant lawsuit, it's hard for me to find any obvious downsides that aren't also possible with virtually every other company out there. Now, I will state that this doesn't mean that there aren't any serious downsides out there, but I've certainly been struggling to find them. There is, of course, always the potential for a wider spread implementation of rent control, which could impact margins, but again, the REIT is well diversified in multiple different geographical areas that have different regulatory governments, so it would be fairly unlikely for that to be a significant worry, at least anytime soon. Also, I will mention that this is a REIT, so distributions will count as income unless they're held in your TFSA or RRSP, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Anyway, this is why the Morgard North American Residential REIT is my top TSX pick for 2022, and it's also the top position in my standard cash portfolio, making up almost 35% of that account, as well as over 70% of the public wealth simple portfolio that I document every month on this channel. I started purchasing shares of Morgard in my Canadian cash portfolio for a little under $16 per share in April of 2021, and I've continued buying the stock since, raising my total cost per share up to $17.38. With that said, I hope that I was able to provide you with some good Canadian investment ideas to research, and who knows, maybe you'll end up deciding to invest in one of them. Either way, I hope that you found some value in this video, and if you did, please share it with someone else who might benefit from seeing it. Because of the length of this video, I tried to keep the coverage on companies that I've already talked about in depth on the channel pretty brief, so if you want a more detailed explanation on the reasoning behind my investments in Morgard, Knight Therapeutics, or MTY Food Group, then check out my monthly portfolio series playlist where you'll be able to find additional details and information on those securities. Also, I know I bring this up a lot, but I am not a financial advisor and I don't want to see anyone lose money on an investment just because they blindly decided to copy one of my ideas. I am a human guy who regularly makes human mistakes, and on top of that, there is nowhere near enough information in this video or any other video of mine to make a diligent investment decision. So please, I'm begging you on your money's behalf, do your own research and come to your own conclusions before you invest in any company. If you don't want to do this kind of research for yourself, then you can always invest in broadly diversified ETFs and get good long-term results without the stress of having to keep up with individual securities. Now, with all of that out of the way, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end, and enjoy the rest of your day.